What I've noticed, uh, I'm going to move over here because the uh, lights are a little too bright. OK, thanks. Um, is that there's a lot of confusion around digital twins. And it has to do with the, the discrete industries and the process industries. So in the, uh, at a high level, these digital twins look very similar. You make something, uh, and uh, you design something, you make it, and then you support it afterwards. But when you get down a little deeper, the business process is a lot different. And I've been a lot of conferences and talked to a lot of people, and, and people seem to be talk, talking past each other, meaning someone from the discrete industries will be talking about a digital twin uh, and trying to explain it to someone in the process industries, and they're really not communicating at all, and vice versa. So uh, the, my uh, introductory presentation is an attempt to uh, clarify some of that confusion uh, and then, of course, the rest of the session will focus on the process industries. So uh, this is our definition of a digital twin. Um, the, uh, uh, in the focus of what I want to talk about is around the uh, 3D model that's there and the business processes. So um, uh, each area, each type of digital twin manages business processes but then also provides uh, information and people navigate to that information through the uh, 3D model. So we look up in the upper right hand corner, um, you'll see uh, an upgrade project going on. There are now uh, current existing three pumps and they're adding a fourth pump. So from the viewpoint of the discrete industries, they're focused on that pump and the bill of materials for the pump, maybe some uh, procedures for maintenance, but it's all around the pump and the motor attached to that pump. Uh, when we go over to the process industries, there's a more that application and how does that pump fit in the larger picture of the entire plant and the pumps nearby. All right. So uh, just to drill into the the, the model for the process injuries a little bit, and then I'll do the same for the discrete. Um, we like to show circles, uh, Venn diagram, because uh, each one of those circles represents a set of business processes. And in design and build, there's a set of business processes, then you have handover, and you go to operate and maintain, uh, and the business processes and operate and maintain are very different. Uh, there's a little overlap for handover. Uh, that green area is, looks large on the slide, but it's actually probably a, a sliver. And this is how we represent the plant asset mass, uh, life cycle rather than chevrons. Chevrons to me uh, is just a path, but it doesn't well represent the business processes that occur in each one of those domain areas. So. We find that Digital Twin uh, in design and build manages usually asset information around the design of the plant uh, and sharing that information through uh, the design and construction uh, to minimize rework so the plant gets delivered on time uh, in budget uh, and in spec, you know, the key KPIs for an EPC, and then comes on stream sooner uh, so that the end user benefits with revenue uh, earlier uh, time to benefit. On the uh, operate and maintain side, we see the benefits more around operational performance, preventing unplanned downtime, for example. With less unplanned downtime, you have higher revenue and a safer plant. So uh, uh, that's the general flow for the uh, process industries. And just to give a couple of examples, You'll see on the left-hand side a list of, uh, of uh, applications uh, uh, for the digital twin uh, use cases. And then there's an example of a, uh, of a screenshot from Bentley Systems uh, plant site. Uh, and again, the key benefit is with the digital twin, the plant for the end user, the plant comes online sooner, you get higher revenue. Uh, I'm not going to go through the use cases. Um, uh, and then for operate and maintain, 
Uh, here we have some screenshots for Unity, who will uh, present later on. Matt will present for Unity. Uh, there, uh, what I like about this is you see uh, operating data and data about the equipment uh, that has to do with operate and maintain. Again, a list of use cases. I'm not going to go through with them. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what we mean for a digital twin and operate and maintain. Now I'm going to go over to discrete industries. Uh, here I have three uh, uh, circles. Uh, the design one is darkened because, uh, quite frankly, uh, design has been using simulation for decades. I don't want to just rename what's been around for decades a digital twin, so I'm going to skip over design. Uh, that's been around for a while. Um, we have manufacturing. We see digital twins being applied to designing and commissioning the assembly line in manufacturing. So we have assembly line commissioning. That means uh, uh, it, it, when I'm not talking about the ring out where you, you figure out if uh, tag 101 is really assigned to the first uh, temperature gauge or not, uh, more around the control program. So does the robot swing around and smash into another robot, you know, two, two robot arms hit, or does a robot arm swing around and take out a, a girder? Uh, or column, rather. You don't want that to happen. That's all very bad. So uh, it it's, does the virtual commissioning for the control programs for the most part. Uh, and then that avoids rework and delays and faster time to benefit, meaning the plant comes on sooner. Then after manufacturing, we see digital twins applied to the product rather than the assembly line. And we see servitization. Uh, that's remote monitoring. Uh, uh, tell the client when something's uh, not going right. Um, and just, a, again, a couple of quick screenshots to give you a sense for what those digital twins look like. Uh, and some use cases on the left side, again. Uh, this particular one comes from Siemens, uh, who's uh, big into uh, uh, digital twins for assembly plants. Uh, the one on the left is for an automotive assembly line. Uh, uh, that is very complex uh, uh, installation, design, commissioning. So uh, digital twins have a lot of benefit there. Uh, they, the scheduling of, a, of a, uh, a, a, a turnover for a new, new uh, model year of an automotive, that uh, 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 design, commissioning, installation, it's scheduled in 15 minute in increments. And I'll just remind you that on a typical automotive assembly line, a car is made roughly once every minute. So if you get that assembly line on, uh, you know, up a day earlier, that's a lot of new cars. Uh, and the one on the right is uh, uh, another type of assembly line, uh, not automotive related. So it goes beyond just automotive, uh, though the key uh, use cases in in uh, automotive assembly plants. The servitization case story is pretty powerful. Uh, for the most part, this is for intelligent uh, equipment that can be uh, monitored in the field. So uh, just to explain the chart, the left uh, uh, y-axis is revenue, uh, and the uh, x-axis is the product life cycle from introduction uh, into the field and the sales. Uh, in first initial sales, and you have a usually a high growth period, and then it gets matured. Maybe there's a replacement product, and you see a decline. Um, that is the normal uh, product life cycle from a revenue viewpoint for an OEM. When you add surfetization, now you're selling a service where you're monitoring the asset in the field. Uh, there's a maybe a quarterly fee or an annual fee for that. Uh, of course, the piece of equipment is in the field long after the last model of that particular product is sold. Uh, so there's a, a huge potential for added revenue. Uh, and it's, it's uh, not unusual to have a business case where the revenue for that product or that model is doubled with uh, servitization. So uh, this is where they're, they're charging that annual fee. and. Uh, 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 
notifying the customer when either something's going wrong with it, it's about to fail, or sometimes it can be operator trading issue. The operator is not quite operating the equipment optimally and uh, needs a little training to, to make it run better. Um, so that is where we see digital twins uh, successfully being applied in the discrete industries. So kind of in summary, uh, you know, this, my pres introductory presentation is really focused on kind of showing the different use cases in discrete and process to try to eliminate some of that confusion. So if you're talking to someone who's from the, I don't know, jet engine industry, uh, and you happen to be operating a plant, uh, there may be some lessons to be learned between the two of you, but I just uh, want to clarify where there may be some disconnects. Uh, maybe you can have a better conversation going forward. Um, at this point, I'd, uh, that's the end of my presentation, uh, and I'd like to bring up the folks from OQ uh, to talk about uh, their application uh, in the uh, upstream oil and gas industry. Uh, thank you. Okay, we are going uh, to present to you one of our cases and uh, presentation in OQ myself, Khalid Al Fahdi, and uh, my colleague also Khalfan, he will join after a few minutes once I done my part. So actually, we will start with the topic. We are call it OQ Digital Transformation with Borobos. And we are going to focus in upstream oil and gas uh, business and uh, industry uh, sector itself. So we, I just start with uh, a small introduction about OQ, who is not uh, here about it. So OQ is an is a, uh, integrated company, new actually integrated company based in Oman. And we are working in uh, more than 17 countries around the world. Mainly we are uh, actually starting from production and uh, exploration of oil and gas. Then we have uh, manufacturing also in petrochemical uh, till we reach to the, as a supply and distribu distribution for uh, uh, many types of chemical uh, around the world. And we are supplying our products more than 80 countries worldwide. So we are one of the key player in our region when we come to the energy and uh, doing uh, some support when we come to the sustainability also in our region itself. So moving to the, uh, what we are doing in upstream and in Oman, exactly. We are managing uh, 10 thousands of assets, including uh, offshore and onshore on upstream oil and gas. And also there is uh, some plants related to the uh, oil and uh, gas processing. Also pipeline, uh, high pressure pipeline, uh, natural gas pipeline across the country, more than 4,000 kilometers. So as you can see across uh, country, there is asset and there is head office, only one head office at uh, Capital Muscat. And we are based on that. We are managing all of these assets in terms of uh, <clears throat> many aspects. So maybe the needs for digitalization and the needs to have uh, proper uh, management of our assets, it is driving us to enable uh, many of the initiatives coming from the team uh, according to the challenge we are uh, facing actually there. So if we are talking about the challenge itself, it's mainly about to how we can get our process performance in optimum way. So when we are, when we are call it optimization or optimum, so we are not only talking about uh, uptime and failures itself, production, but also we are talking about the cost in the same time. We are questioning about how we can maximize the asset life cycle itself for our assets, installed asset, and how we can get the maximum value for it in safe manner. Uh, at the end, we, we have to take care about safety also, about the process safety itself, about our people, and also about the uh, business itself and the economy of it. So there is four pillars we are focusing on it uh, as a challenge. It is about the strategy development and how actually we can build our strategy itself as a fundamental, what we are going to implement, and how we can integrate one of the challenge about the disciplines, how we can bring all, all the team together to solve the problems. 
And the, the famous issues maybe in this conference we are a lot talk about in all sessions is about the data management, how we can uh, get the data and use them, analyze them, and get the best from them to optimize our decisions at the end. So all of these pillars actually, uh, they are our challenges and uh, what we are focused uh, on them. I will give you here a, a general uh, overview about uh, the achievement first, uh, after we apply many of the initiatives in uh, four area actually. It is about, uh, the area of the reliability management, operation and maintenance, asset integrity and production chemistry. In this four area, there is many of the initiatives. Uh, in coming slide, I will show to you some of the initiatives. And my colleague also, he will deep dive in one of the solution and one of the initiative we applied and get the benefit. But in general, we managed to have a single platform of data reporting, storage, analysis, and visualization, where we have all of them in one platform. And also we digitized most of our site activities using handheld and smart barcoding. So we solve the big issue when we are using papers most of the time for the collecting the data itself. We are reaching also one of the big achievements for us is the plant reliability growth up to 25% uh, within five years. So we can say five uh, plus percent yearly annually, we can get uh, a growth in reliability when we come to the asset. So that reflecting directly to the less failures uh, and directly from this number. Also, we managed to have uh, optimization in the, in the cost of the maintenance, total maintenance cost by 14.8% saving. And this is a big achievement for us because we reduced the unplanned downtime and unplanned activities in maintenance. This is the impact directly to the, the cost itself. Chemical optimization, also we did a chemical optimization in yearly basis by 16%. This is uh, making us uh, to run our uh, plant and our process with optimum uh, chemical uh, costing us with optimum value. So that is very uh, a good achievement as well. When we come to the asset uptime, we maintain our target at 98% for upstream. And this is our target as uh, either as be, as be best practice, actually. It is something between 95 to 98%. You can utilize your activities. There is still plan downtime. And there is still some activities you need to do it and forced to do it. Also in terms of process safety, it is, uh, we need to mention that. There is zero tier one and tier two recorded uh, after we start uh, implementing the initiatives, which is directly reflecting to the high performance when we come to the process safety itself. From environment point of view and sustainability, just because we reduce the trip and the failures, uh, total failure for the plants, we have managed actually to reduce also the flaring because the blue, blue down of the gases in the system by 82%. Uh, flaring less comparing with the uh, before five years we have in the same plant. So this is also one of the achievements. Maybe people, they are not uh, looking after that one. In, uh, they are looking more in the design itself of the system and how we can improve the design. But here, uh, maybe I forget to mention it is a brown field. We are not talking here about something in a green field, but it's a brown field. And we need to make sure also about the sustainability itself. A matter of stakeholders also, stakeholders we have, we need to deal with engineering and with the IT people, with the contract supply chain and HSE project to achieve what we achieved actually on this, uh, uh, what we talk about. Interfaces, also we are interfaces, many systems, ABM, Bentley system we are using here, and also we are using CMMS, CMMS is we are using SAP as AB, and there is also uh, from the process data itself, we are using actually OSI by and uh, BHD, uh, BHD from uh, Hanwell, both of them, and also Power BI from Microsoft. So all of these actually solutions, it can maybe not work alone, but it, it should come uh, together to maximize the value for it. So I can see here our ABM is one of the main platform we used for our uh, initiatives. And it is, I can see it, it is one of the enabler for the innovation. Actually, we are just trying to solve the unique problems we have, and the tool is supporting us to do so. Moving forward, just a bit uh, detail about the initiatives. Here, I just listed 15 initiatives already completed, and we're already starting to get the benefit from them. 
and it is in the four pillar again for reliability management. We are managed to have operational RAM KPIs calculated automatically. So the, fee, the information feed coming to the system and we have live data just coming to us and we know exactly what is the RAM for each single tag number. And this is uh, supporting us to do the bad actor and many of the activities. Our condition monitoring, as the traditional condition monitoring, we managed also to digitize uh, them. And it is also there, loop oil and uh, vibration, whatever require, uh, any, any tools we are using actually in condition monitoring, it's already recorded now digital. We can refer to it and we can uh, just return to it and uh, uh, collaborate with other uh, things. RCM, also it is uh, in the part of the platform and, we, and also the program of fracas. Maybe reliability people, they know the fracas itself. It's about failure reporting, analysis and corrective action system. Where also we digitize this one. It is one of the powerful tool for continuous improvement and it's uh, used um, uh, to reduce the failures itself. From operation and maintenance point of view, we digitize the operator round and also we digitize maintenance itself. So people, technicians, they are using uh, no more papers. They have their checklist, they have their procedures. In the tablet, they can collect whatever they, they, they found when they are just trying to do maintenance. They take photo, they take, so later stage we can analyze, we can improve RCM itself, and we can do more for that information. Also, we are using uh, the interface between ABM and CMMS, both of them interfaced, and we are using also to request for work. And that is one of the, uh, the very good, actually, uh, uh, procedure we used because it is allowing us to capture whatever happened at site. So people, they cannot uh, request for work uh, unless they capture some points we request them to do it through the process, the, the process flow digital. So that is uh, allow us also to capture many of the information during that process, and we can use them uh, in many aspects uh, itself. There is failure and downtime reporting very constant. So our RAM calculation also it is accurate and we know it is reflecting the actual uh, RAM. It is not something just we are as assume. It is something actual and we can depend on them. Also we are uh, developing a lot in asset integrity. So just the, here is one of the initiatives we have. So all the NDT inspection for example, for the uh, normal inspection, it is already recorded in the system and it can be used anytime. RBI study itself is done there. So it is something as a dynamic coming where we can just update immediately the system and we know exactly what will happen. When we come to the corrosion control, we have two systems already implemented. One of them related to the cathodic protection systems where we can have live monitoring of it, where we can see it in the dashboard and we can see whatever happened within the system itself immediately, not waiting for the three monthly or six monthly uh, re, uh, check to know the healthiness of the system itself. IOW, it is one of the famous things, integrity operating window, also it's digitized, and also anomaly management uh, with the same. Projection chemistry as latest, it is one of the initiative, and Khalfan, he going to through, through it after my, after a few minutes, inshallah he will come, and uh, give you a lot about this uh, chem chemistry, how we can actually put the chemistry now within all of these aspects of reliability, process safety, and integrity in a process plant. And anyhow, process, most of the process plant, they are using chemical. And uh, managing the chemical itself, it's also important for us. This is just example here about the dashboard we developed. This is one of the corrosion management dashboard in offshore. And uh, actually, it is supporting us to monitor and to see exactly what we have in offshore and uh, monitor the corrosion itself on it. Moving forward, this is also a picture from site, how the people, they are taking uh, reading and do some inspection using handhelds and barcode. So they are um, mainly using handheld actually with every information there. They can access the history immediately. They can see the previous inspection. They can see the next inspection due and they can put whatever information they need there. Uh, why we are doing all of this? Maybe this is one of the, best, uh, the question people ask. Why we need to reach that point? Again, maybe I return back a little bit with Ralph's uh, presentation before I start. He talked about digital twin. And uh, at the end, digital twin itself, it cannot be useful and adding value to the business and to the process plant unless we have information on it. 
And uh, digital twin is not only 3D uh, dimension uh, asset, but we need actually some information which helping us to make decisions. And whatever we did from the digital transformation itself for our activities in terms of the reliability, integrity, process safety, operation and maintenance, and whatever we can just analyze and bring a dashboard, it, it, it will be part of the digital twin itself. So we have actually moved to the digital twin. And in 2021, we finalized a feasibility study for it just to make sure our brown field is ready for digital twin because it's one of the difficult. Maybe green field is easy to do digital twin easier, but not for the brown field. So we did a feasibility study. Last year and this year, we are in the BOC, uh, proof of concept, where we need to prove to our management there is a value to scale up our uh, digital twin. We know digital twin will come by in the future and it will be there, but it will take uh, a bit time to just uh, prove the value of it. Then we can go further. So I will hand over to Khalfan. Thank you very much. So welcome again. This is uh, Khalfan, Production Chemistry and Laboratory Service uh, Team Lead in OQ Upstream. Let's talk about the ChemTrack. This ChemTrack is our solution for, and, uh, for managing the chemicals. It's digitalized for convenience and optimized for efficiency. So what we are saying usually, start while in your mind. And what was in our mind, what was the end? The end, when we, when we start, we need to have a platform where we can get everything in one go. I, my ambition, my, our aspiration target, I need to get everything, I need to get understand everything related to production chemistry in just a couple of seconds. I don't need to spend more time, I don't need to spend uh, analyzing the graphs, putting the data, I need to, in my desk, to set everything. I can understand what is going right and what is going wrong in terms of production chemistry and laboratory surface. And also, the end that was in my mind we need to have something where everything can be more digitalized, integrated, automated, and uh, shareable. Let's explore more about the ChemTrack, what it's about, and what the story behind this uh, ChemTrack. So moving, moving forward, I mean, from where we are struggling. Before the ChemTrack, the life, it was not easy. So in terms of low efficiency, if you can see delay in collecting and analyzing the data, the data were scattered in different uh, files we have, uh, you see, imagine that we are having more than 40 chemicals. And for each chemical, we are, we need, we are doing like three, more than 10 laboratory analysis. So if you need to know how the performance of each chemical, how many analysis you need to do, and how many graph you need to do. And this can be hundreds of graphs. So how much time you need if you, need, if you do it, uh, manually, it will be um, a nightmare uh, activities. So another things of the main driver behind the chem track is ineffective performance. No system in place for production chemistry management. So we used to use the normal practice as Excel, but you know Excel is good, but not it cannot be considered as for the long term solution. And another things the main driver of the chem track is lack of single version of truth. We don't have a platform. The data are scattered in different files. If you need any data, you need to dig more in each file. Today I am here, I can get access to the data, but tomorrow I'm not around. If anyone come, he need to search more and investigate from where he can get the data. So this is another, another driver of the developing the chem track. The third point, not optimal operating cost. We used to invest more in the chemical. You know how the chemical is there. Is, I mean, if you're in oil and gas industry, one of the largest expenditures in the chemical. And you, see, you can see the graph uh, from 2017, 2018, up to 2019, how much we are spending in the chemical. So the management are not happy about the chemical. So we need to have something that can help us to overcome all of these uh, challenges. Then, Yeah, we come up with the chem track. So the chem, this is the journey of the chem track. The old practice, we used to use Excel, and this was starting 2014 till 2020. But as I mentioned to you, Excel is not uh, cannot be used for long-term solution. Then what we did, 
we have many softwares in the, in the company, and we found, we know the tools, and we know what we need. So we investigate the tools and the software, and we found one of the software that ABM can mimic whatever we need for the chem track. So we deploy all these features that initially developed in Excel in ABM, and this is uh, in 2021 and 2022. And starting from, starting from this year, to uh, 2023, we are heading to have the web. So all the, all the, I mean, the graphs or the dashboard are in the web base. So when, in, on, your, on your, you can understand what is going right and what everything related to the production chemistry. Now let's dig more and I will see you how ChemTrack make the life easier for me and how I can get everything in just a couple of seconds and on your disk. So let's move ahead. So what in the production chemistry and laboratory surface, if you ask any production chemist, our main rule in production chemistry is to maintain the quality of the crude or to maintain the quality of the processing fluid and also maintain the integrity. And But th through what? Through have better chemical performance. So we are injecting chemical in the system. So we need to make sure those chemicals are working well. And also by doing different laboratory analysis. So you are tracking the chemical performance by doing laboratory analysis. This is one of the, our role as a production chemist. And other things, we are also maintaining the chemical stock. We need to make sure that we have enough chemical stock. So if you have many chemicals and if you don't have a platform to track the stock of those chemicals, and you know how the channeling we are suffering from in the supply chain of the chemicals. So if you have a platform where you can immediately understand, if you look at the number one, tracking of chemical stock management data, if you look on this graph, you will see the list of the chemical. You can immediately understand for how many days I have stock for each chemical. So just I'm here, I'm sitting, I can know, oh, I have, I have low uh, stock for this chemical. I can immediately make the order and contact the supply chain. And uh, the, the same things for the first one, tracking laboratory analysis uh, data. You see, this is show the compliance of the laboratory analysis. So imagine that, I mean, in daily basis, we have around more than 50 laboratory analysis. So if I need to know how many analysis I'm as a team lead, as a manager, I don't need, I don't have a time to track each individual laboratory analysis. But this one, you can see, I can immediately know how many analysis the compliance. So if I can see that the, the, the lab team managed to deliver around 90% of the laboratory analysis, this make me happy. So that, that means they did all what have been requested from them. Another thing, so if you look for the uh, tracking, the tracking of the chemical performance data, look on the one on the, on the right, on the top corner. You see that you, here you will see all performance of, love of all chemicals. So immediately I can understand if I see all the chemicals are more than 90%, that's it. I don't need to investigate more. So that means this will make me, I'm, I, I'm, I'm satisfied. That is told, show me the chemical performance for all chemicals, that's, uh, that's enough. Another thing, tracking of the contract management data, you see that this is about the expenditure. So you see in the beginning of the, each year, we have the chemicals and we are requesting from the bank to set a budget for us. So this is the budget. This is the budgeted value. And the lower one show the actual value. So this will tell you, give you an idea whether you are upper spin or you are lower spin and through this, uh, through this uh, graph. So let's investigate more about how we manage to get all this uh, stuff in, in one platform. You see here the, the data or the, the data is passing through three stages. The first stage is the data input and we have in the data processing and we have the data output. We are getting, we have the handheld. On the handheld, all the data requested from the laboratory chemist to enter. They are receiving it in daily basis. They enter them. And some of the data, we get the online data through the analyzer, if you see online data. And all the historical record, we have the, um, we, we, can, we can upload them through data loader in ABM. So this, all these sort of data are integrated and processed in ABM, in, 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 this, in this software. So it can accommodate the online data, it can accommodate the laboratory data, and it can accommodate the historical record. And then we come up with the, with, you see, we, we come up with, the, with the, all these uh, graphs. So I can get the performance for, I mean, one analysis. If you see the one on the top, one analysis, 
And if you need if one analysis not make sense, you can get many analysis in one platform. The second, the second graph, and the third one, it show the compliance for all laboratory analysis. This is related to the laboratory management data. Now, for the chemical performance, we, with the same data being entered by the laboratory, by laboratory technician, the data are entered only once, basically. And then we are getting all these, uh, the outcomes or the fruits. You see then the, the, the first, the first uh, in the first graph, you will get the performance for all chemicals. If you are a doubt for performance of any particular chemical, you go to the next uh, graph and you will see, and then you will see, oh, what happened to that chemical? It show low performance. You can investigate further, and you will find all the analysis being used to tracking the performance of that laboratory uh, analysis. So you, here we have a, you have like um, a dashboard, and on that dashboard, click the performance. If you are not happy about the performance, click the second uh, dashboard. It will show you what analysis being used for tracking the performance of that particular chemicals. Moving ahead, and this is for the chemical stock. Well, you see that in the, the this is the first dashboard is for the management. The management they are because the operation they are very keen about the. Uh, business continuity. They make they need to make sure that we have enough stock. So the first is for them. When they say that we have enough stock for more than 30 days, they will feel happy. So then you can go to the, the second the second graph for the end user for the chemist. He will see the how much stock for one chemical, and then the third one it will show you how much chemical how much chemical we have in the tank itself. And uh, you see that there is like up and down, up and down that there is a top up on the chemicals. Moving ahead, for the, we have a lot for the, for the stock. This accumulated estimated consumption, because as I mentioned to you, in the beginning of the year, we are putting the estimated consumption for each chemical. This is our estimation. And the second one, we have two graphs. The estimated one and the actual one. You will see where you are and where you're supposed to be, whether you are like underspin or you are upper spin. The third one is very, it is the automation of the supply chain. In the supply chain for the chemical, we have the chemical stock, and we have also we request to have a chemical at site, for example, 30 days, and we are also requesting from the supplier to make a stock for around 60 days. So this one, it will show you where you are or where you're supposed to be. The third graph, you will see three graphs, actual stock, chemicals at site, and chemical in the country. Then this is to make sure that you have enough stock inside as well as in the country. The last one for the uh, contract management. For the contract management, as I mentioned to you, for each chemical, we set a plan. For each day, we suppose for this particular chemical, we will use like 50 liter, then 100 liter, and so on and so forth. So this is the estimated consumption. But how are you doing? Are you doing based on the estimation? Are you are overspin or you are lower spin? This one it will show you uh, immediately. It will show you for one chemical, and it also show you for the entire chemical, for the entire contract. When you will see, you will immediately understand how you are doing with your contract. Additional to that, also in terms of the contract duration. The contract is set for five years, and this is two years. So how much time requested till the contract? Contract value and contract time also, which is automatically uh, tracked. And this is the main, the main, I mean, whatever I have mentioned uh, to you regarding the chem track is they make life easier for us in terms of the OPEX optimization, lean, shareable, flexible, cost optimization, and data centralization and automation. And I, I am proud to say that ChemTrack has been selected as the best practice and as the best uh, in the operational excellence in a cross operator in Oman, in oil and gas operator. So this is, uh, it was in selected in 2020. And I can mention to you the framework of the ChemTrack, it can accommodate with other industry. With, with not only in oil and gas industry, it can be for food industry, in the medicine, because at the end, all what you need, we need to data feed, process the data, and the outcomes. If you know how to set all this calculation, then the life, you can do it. And the ChemTrack has, is strong enough to accommodate all these sort of the analysis. Not to take more from your time, that's the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about our journey to digital transformation. Uh, we are making a digital twin in our basic design in Petrobras. I'm, I'm working as digital, as a digital engineering manager for downstream segment. 
Uh, I work in managing the 2D and 3D databases, uh, verifi verifying the completeness and developing new solutions and coordinating new digital solutions in Petrobras. So uh, here we have some talks about Petrobras. Petrobras is a oil company, a, national, a Brazilian national company. And we are known by the, the, the oil and production and natural gas production and exploration in ultra deep waters. Uh, our values, we are committed to people, society, partners, sharehold, uh, shareholders, and we have 12 uh, refineries. We production 2.7 million barrels of oil per day. And last year, we issued our strategic plan with our forward-looking statements. We are investing in deep and ultra-deep water, in refining modernization, in technology, and in decarbonization, and we developing always new solutions for our projects. Here we have the organogram of Petrobras. Uh, maybe it's too small to, to read, but uh, I'm working here in the surface refining uh, gas and energy system where we have the downstream engineering. And Petrobras is responsible for developing the conceptual and basic design. Then we, had, uh, we have a, a bidding process to contract an EPC to construct, uh, commission, and start up our plant. And the downstream engineering is responsible for develop the concept of basic engineering. And in 2018, uh, we are foreseeing that Petrobras would invest in even more in downstream. We would retake some projects, we would construct new, ref new units, plants, and we will reform some refineries, modernization in new refineries. And we have the, uh, a huge challenge. If we were having uh, more project per year, we need to reduce the project duration, and, but we need to improve the quality. Uh, in Brazil, we have some laws and standards that define the minimum scope required to start a bid process. And in Petrobras, we have a maturity level that defines the, the minimum scope and the completeness of a project. So I, I can't reduce the duration, reduce the scope. I needed to improve the quality of the project, issue more documents, but reducing the duration. So it was a, a, a big challenge for us. And our basic design in 2018, we used mostly uh, the, the CAD solutions. Uh, we used Excel. Uh, most of the information were manually inputted in the system, and we were document driven. Uh, that means that if I need some information, I have to wait the document be issued so I can use that information of the document. But in this increase all, uh, this increase a lot of our, our projects time. And we need to be more digital to reduce the project duration. So it's easy, but uh, how to become more digital? We had many questions when we started this, this journey and we had our traditional basic design, and one of the questions we had in the beginning was where we want to get to. We need to define what the scope to be more digital. And we heard a lot about the Industry 4.0, and we figured it out if we were an engineer in 4.0, we would use the digital twin, we use the AR, VR solution, cloud solution, and all the stuff of Industry 4.0. But uh, how we get there, or how to start? Uh, we need to change. We need to change our process of working, but we need to increase in steps. We need to explain to our teams the steps to, be, to increase, because we are moving from our traditional basic design and jumping into uh, an engineering 4.0 that would be very different we will use it too. So we define some steps to explain to our team. And we had another question there, when start? How we start is okay, but when start was the most difficult question we had to answer. 
because when you ask to people to change, uh, everyone wants change, but no one wants to change. And when you ask people, they always say, oh, I have a, a bigger fish to fry, I'm so busy, I don't have time this year, let's start next, next year, next project. My project is very complicated, but we are decided. We have to start as soon as possible because we didn't have much time to wait. And we decided to start, and we defined that all new project would start in a database. So it was a, a change for us. And what project we would select? Uh, so we also had many questions by the people. Uh, let's start with a small project. Let's start with a project that is already completed. Let's start with a project that is fake. It's not a real project. But we decided to start with the most important project in Petrobras downstream. Why that? Because people do not have a slot to, to make a fake project. They finish a project to start another project. So we don't have time. So we decide, let's take the most important project, the biggest project we have, and let's start. And how we engage our teams, we engage our manager, the, the champions. We talk to everybody, we talk to the managers, we try to engage as much as we could. Uh, we, we listen to the concern of people. They, are, they were concerned about the support. Uh, how could they be? They have support to to be to help them. Uh, so my team worked very hard here, helping people, correcting rare errors, uh, correcting mistakes, and the problems always happen in the last last minute. When you are about to issue a document, you have a problem in the system, and the the team needs someone to support them. So it was we did for most of the time. And what do we mean to be data-driven? Uh, we explain to people that to work in a basic design in a database is just one person input some data in a database system so that another person can get the information, do his calculation, and fulfill the database with all the information. And all the person enter the database and collect information and put information. After that, we can issue all documents in our project. And what do we mean to be data-centric? We need all teams uh, working together in the same database. For many years in Petrobras, we worked with several databases, and they were not connected with each other. And we tried to have all the teams working in the same database, and we use the solution Comus as a database system to collect all information and all the teams working together. And how about automating the design? Uh, we have our process simulation software with many streams and many properties in each streams, and we have our pipe and instrumentation diagrams. And I need to collect information from the simulation and put the information in the piping. But I don't, I don't want to, to type the information. I want to automate the system. So we import all the information from the process simulation into the commons, and we link the piping with the stream that passes through it. So once the piping and the stream is connected, all the information is sent to the piping. And when I connect the equipment to the pipe, the equipment receives that information. And if the equipment is an electrical equipment, the electrical system also receives all the information. And all the instrumentation connected to the pipe also receives the same information. Here we have an example of a pin ID. And we can see the pin ID in colors. So we can see how the stream is passing through all the equipment and pipings. But what the most benefit in that? If I have a change in the simulation, I don't have to type anything. I can re-import the simulation, and Comus show me where I have to update the information, what device needs to be updated because the stream or the simulation had changed. And that's helped a lot, because we, in our project, uh, we had uh, to re-simulate the conditions, and we estimated that the project will have a delay of two months. But uh, 
once the information was all connected, physically and logically connected, we could revise all the documents in one week. So it's very, very quick, very fast to revise all the documents. And now, we, what are our deliverables in Petrobras when we finish a basic design? We deliver a 3D model. Uh, Alan, could you please start the video in the left hand, please? So we move it from the 2D dimension, and now we are developing a 3D model in our basic design, so we can clarify the scope even better. We deliver that 3D model in the bidding process, and the bidders can use the 3D for simulate the construction of the unit. They can uh, estimate the cost uh, precisely. They can verify clash that they, they do the clash detection. What else? It's a, a lot of a lot of simulation that can do in the BD process. Once we have the 3D model, we can use the laser scanning and the point cloud to compare the field against the project. Uh, please, the second. So here is an example. We scanned a unit, and you can compare side by side the visualization of the point cloud in the left and the 3D model in the right, and you can verify verify what's the difference between the field and the, the as designed project. Oh, sorry. Oops. And here are the, the benefits we had. First of all, once we have all the information connected, we can verify for, uh, the consistency automatically, and we can verify information, the consistency among systems integrated with Comus. Once we deliver the 3D model, the, the 3D model base, database in the bid, they can do all the simulation, and in the future we are going to deliver the Comus database also. Uh, we have our teams always working together in the same database, sharing information, uh, delivering information on time and to the right team needed. We use laser scanning to compare design versus construction. We can accurate our 3D model, and we can have a 3D model real as built. We can integrate the 2D and 3D with the schedule and the cost. So we're starting using the advanced work packaging uh, of CII. And we are starting to use the building information modeling also in our project to track the, the scope progress. And every year we have the team working, developing new solutions. Not only my team in the digital engineering develop new solutions, but also all the teams in Petrobras in, in downstream engineering uh, working, developing new solutions every year. Uh, once we have all this database, we are starting in using the data science in our project. We now we are collecting all that information and start the machine learning to predict information to dimension equipment automatically. And last but not least, what we learned. Uh, we, we always think that the, the transformation starts with technology, but we learned that we make the digital transformation with people work together. Once the people start working together, all teams engaged, working the same scope, we could speed up our digital transformation. We could be agile, we using the quick wins, and we, when we need to correct something, we connect faster. Uh, we train all the teams to use and develop solutions. Uh, it's very important to train the teams. When you use a, a, a new solution for the very first time, you think you're going to, to reduce the time. But now and then, you increase the time in the very first time, because the team do not know use that new solution. But we do not give up. We keep at it until the team knows how to use the information, how to use the new solution. And with the, with the past go by, we can reduce the time in our projects. And we involve all disciplines to develop new solutions. We have all the teams empowered, working together, and developing new solutions every year. And like one said before, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. It's that we learn in these years. And thank you so much for the opportunity.
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start my presentation on a bit of a super awkward note. Uh, well, awkward because I'm a little bit nervous, and also awkward because um, Justin uh, couldn't be here today. Uh, he works for a company called BP. Um, and so he asked us to, if, uh, if we could do the presentation um, on his behalf, which of course is no problem, um, except they went on to say, hey, you know what, we're a little bit sensitive about this project. If you could just uh, be careful about how much you share, maybe crop out anything sensitive. Uh, and also, um, don't, don't mention us by name, you know, or, or that the project's for us. So um, if everybody could just go ahead and forget the company that Justin works for, um, that would help keep me out of trouble. It's pretty easy, it's only two letters. So uh, that's my awkward introduction. <laughs> Secondly, um, before I get into the case study and sort of explaining uh, what we did for them and, 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 and why, um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a level set about who we are as a company. Obviously, we have a booth here. I'm talking to a lot of different people. Um, it's interesting people understand, like, what is game technology? What is a game engine? You know, and, and why is it relevant? And that's a completely fair uh, question to ask. So just, just quickly, I'll just take a minute here to cover it. Um, Unity is the number one game development um, environment for video game makers uh, in the world. So it's, it's software that people use to make games. Um, and the, our reach is significant. I think it's something like 60 to 70% of all games are made with Unity. And if you've ever played with a HoloLens or a virtual reality um, device, that number increases uh, considerably. It's almost like 70 to 80%. So it's a very um, ubiquitous tool uh, in the world of game makers. And if you look around the room, you know, there's this, you can see people kind of looking at their phones. They're, they're probably playing a game right now. Um, they're, they're the ones with their mouths half open. Uh, and it's probably Candy Crush. So, I mean, that's all fine, you know. Um, the point is, video games are a big deal. Um, maybe you don't play games yourself, but you probably know someone who does. Um, and the second part of that question is, well, you know, why is video games relevant to digital transformation? And if you think about it, the, um, what is a multiplayer game? Well, it's a bunch of people exchanging data in real time through the internet. Uh, there's rules and physics and that kind of thing. There's security and authentication. Um, and the experience is agnostic. So whether I'm using my Android phone, you're on a Samsung tablet, someone else is on a laptop, uh, the experience is all the same. So basically, all of the architecture that would go into supporting that delivery is the same architecture that we would use to deliver uh, you know, um, maintenance, planning, multi-person experience for engineers. So it's, it's a very relevant technology for, uh, for that reason. And we've solved that problem already for millions of games and literally hundreds of millions of game players across the world as, as we speak. And so the application for that in industry is pretty obvious, and it's not just in energy. We're seeing it also in, in all sorts of industries um, across, across the world. So as we get into the case study for the unnamed customer, um, I just want to touch on a few things that we did for them and, and why they use our platform. And the presentation is less on the aesthetics of the project and the look and feel, and it's more about kind of the rationale behind it. And so in this case, the customer had built uh, a digital twin uh, maintenance planning tool using our technology uh, themselves, and it was cool, you know, good for them. Um, and uh, they had some good case studies in mind, and they, they were kind of taking it places. And they came to us and said, hey, you know, we, we need to accelerate this um, to get, you know, more stake in, uh, more buy-in, sorry, from our stakeholders. And so we asked them, okay, well, what do you need to do? And so basically, uh, they wanted to leverage our solution and our technology as the architects of it to, to make it go a lot faster. And um, part of that was building a, a data ingest pipeline. Another part of it was improving the user experience, um, which is very important. Um, but ultimately, they wanted to take advantage of some of our you know, modular architecture. And so, for example, like, we want to turn this into a multiplayer experience. So we were able to bolt on uh, what we call a presence, but basically it just means like the ability to have voice chat and collaboration, um, you know, presenter modes, this kind of stuff. I can send someone a link and say, hey, meet me in the generator room, and we're going to go and draw some circles around valves. Um, and it was all very much uh, in, a, in a way that was conducive with the, um, the data infrastructure and the architecture that they had, in which case, in this case, it was Azure. Um, and so, yeah, we were able to do that for them. And because of the nature of our technology, it, was, it was, wasn't as simple as, but it was pretty much as straightforward as being able to bolt those uh, services on and connect all that, all that together. 
And in so doing, you know, we're providing a, a new way of helping the customer um, explain to their internal stakeholders and their internal leadership where this is all going, what this, this digital transformation is enabling them to do, uh, and it's helping them change how they think about data and their kind of goals of the future. And when you start to think about you know, the benefit of that, ultimately this customer understood that we can go out and we can buy digital twin solutions. And um, you know, they're considerable levels of effort, they're like seven figure investments, um, but they don't necessarily scale that well. Um, and it's expensive if it costs you, you know, millions of dollars every time you want to deploy a new digital twin. It's not really very repeatable. So they were drawn to our technology because uh, the way that we architect our solutions makes it a lot easier to do that to the point where eventually um, you could actually reduce that cost from you know, seven figures down to like a, a low reasonable six figures and it's a much easier um, lift and shift to be able to repeat it for new facilities. And in so doing that also meets their scalable vision of the future. The customer had looked at a lot of different solutions and a big part of their digital transformation strategy was like they understood that you know, a black box solution that's highly proprietary, that doesn't connect to anything, it doesn't play nice, um, is not really ideal for them. Their vision of digital transformation in the future says that, uh, you know, they want these solutions to be able to speak to each other. It's not, Unity is not the miracle solution to every problem that you have, but that's fine, I'm not trying to be. But it has to be a connected systems of systems, and to make it easier for them to build these types of applications on their own is something that's uh, hugely uh, attractive to them. Um, yeah. So, a little bit about the why. So, our architecture is inherently designed with composability uh, and extensibility in mind. And as I said, we're, we're helping them march towards that goal of simplifying, um, you know, the digital twin applications in the future to the point where you don't need to be a Unity developer or an expert in coding to be able to do this. And they have a vision of what they call citizen development or like basically low no code solutions so that you can it's almost drop and drag at that point and while the technology to do that isn't quite there yet obviously putting all of this infrastructure in place and basically creating a sandbox development environment for them enabled them to understand the the the, the potential for the future and and explain to the leadership okay the investment to get us to this point is x but in the future, it's gonna be a lot less because it's much more modular. And most importantly, like for them, they didn't want the burden of having to support this tool or have their own developers in house or having to have a big team that it costs to maintain this platform when they're using the Unity solution because this is our business. As we improve and update and make changes to our platform, those benefits are passed along to the customer. So we, in a sense, we're the mechanics of the solution, and we just make it super easy for them to build their own custom application that just sits on top of all of that. So I think um, the, the takeaway from this for me, I think, is very much that the, the digital transformation strategy is very much contingent, I think, on, on understanding how and where you want the data to work and make it work for you. And uh, you know, Unity is, is a great solution to do that. As I said, it's not the silver bullet. It's not the magical everything. Um, but in this case, it, at least it allowed this customer uh, to move their agenda forward. And that's basically that. At this point, we have Q&A. And, &A, and uh, I think Alan. Alan, are you going to be with the, okay, Alan's going to have the microphone. So uh, uh, now the way we're going to do this, uh, you know, because Alan's a you know, very energetic guy, we're going to start with a question on the left side and then the next question go on the right. So Alan has to run back and forth. <laughs> so uh, let me ask a, a question first of uh, David. Uh, 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 and you'll have to share the mics, so, uh, you know, be kind to each other and pass the mics. Uh, you know, David just joined the, the uh, panel here. Uh, he's with Coise of a division of uh, Bentley Systems. Uh, you know, uh, OQ is uh, in the oil and gas. Are you in other industries other than just uh, oil and gas? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've, we've got digital twins in the water space. Uh, you know, the work in the UK with ha both High Speed 2 and National Highways is something that, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill could certainly lift and shift uh, into North America and put some more sustainable uh, transportation into this country. Um, 
I would suggest that pretty much every, or every vertical is uh, actively pursuing the digital twin. Um, what I will suggest, however, is um, I'm, I think OQ is a really interesting case study because they're going about the process a little bit differently. They're, they're spe every now and then, every three or five years, there's a special company that comes along that realizes that in the hare and the tortoise race, the tortoise always wins the race. It's because they have taken the steps to digitalize their experience, to, to make that the data that's going to drive the digital twin, right? So a digital twin should allow you to, uh, should be an immersive experience. We saw that, right? But it's being able to consume your experience immersively is the differentiator to getting the decisions and the value from a digital twin. So if we learned anything from what those gentlemen were talking about is they put those cornerstone, those foundation blocks in place and they will accelerate past the hairs to get a real digital twin that will solve their problems and provide the level of value that we, we to be honestly, it's a bit of a scatter plot, but those are the organizations that tend to be in the 1% club. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Jose, again, you joined the panel. Yep. Uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about perhaps what other industries your your software is used in other than just uh, oil and gas. Yeah, and I think you covered a little bit in our discrete side of the business. But okay. in process industries, we have oil and gas, of course, chemicals, uh, mining. Uh, we cover pharma with not only engineering solutions. We have simulation. We have uh, operation intelligence. So really the whole spectrum of the, the digital twins for many industries. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. thank you. So is uh, are we, oh, Alan's already got somebody. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, I'm Eugene Spiropoulos with Yoko Gala, a technology evangelist for different types of systems. Uh, this question is for Matt with Unity. Uh, it's a two-part question, sorry. Um, and the first is a little bit of a cheeky one. What is, um, the advantages of Unity for this sort of application compared to something like Unreal Engine? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, Unity is not the only horse in the race. There's obviously there's Unreal Engine from Epic. There's also um, Omniverse from NVIDIA. They're, they're all awesome platforms. Um, how does Unity differ or what's the advantage? Well, without preaching too much, um, Unity kind of excels in more lightweight applications, so mobile phones, uh, AR headsets, where, where horsepower, if you will, is sort of a limiting factor. Unity tends to optimize things a lot well, a lot better. Uh, and secondly, Unity has an enormous platform. It's like eight, eight million Unity developers exist out there in the world. So there's a huge community. You can literally like Google, like, how do I connect SAP to Unity? And like, there's probably someone's figured it out. And a huge asset store as well. Uh, and it's, generally speaking, quite easy to learn and get started with. I mean, it gets complicated pretty quick, but I would probably say that's where Unity excels mostly in that the community is much more ubiquitous. And if the end user application is an iPad or, or a tablet, which inevitably it ends up being, I think Unity excels a little bit there. Thanks, and I think you started to answer the second part of the question, which is how easy it is to interface, because the value of the digital twin is the information that you interface into the platform, and I was going to ask how easy it is to interface um, information within our industrial paradigms, right? You know, with our types of protocols. Sure. Well, I, it's it's a sliding scale of complexity. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I can super oversimplify and be like, it's easy. Um, but the reality is, it's very bespoke to the needs of the customer and this and the platform that you're trying to integrate with. The vision of Unity is that it's like a visual, uh, you know, user layer, the user interaction layer that lives on top of all of these data platforms. Unity is not trying to be the the heavy engineering, you know, um, mathematical solution behind the scenes. If anything, it's a it's a platform that you feed data into, and it simplifies making the experience that you would use to interpret that information. All right. Uh, can I add to that? Uh, sure, you can. Of course. Uh, I'm not. So we, you talked about the ecosystem and some of the other partners. Just so you know how important this market is, NetVidia 
has a market cap of, of, I think it's something like $580 billion. They're the eighth most valuable company in the world right now. If you don't think that they're not going to use this as a, use a digital twin as their mechanism to expand your business, right, and to realize the benefits of the metaverse uh, moving forward, right, I mean, you, you re really need to look at how our kids today consume information. Those companies are just going to take off, I mean. Uh, I'll, I'll add a quick comment that I've, just as a trend, I've noticed that uh, uh, people 30, in their 30s and under uh, take to digital twins very readily. And it, 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 I had a conversation with one of the uh, particular advocates, and it dawned on me that uh, that person started talking about the games they used to play when they were a kid. And it dawned on me that, you know, that 30 and in, in their 30s, 40 and under or so, uh, you know, they're used to a 3D environment because they played games so much when they were younger. And, and uh, that is the next generation of user interface for that cohort, uh, is the 3D model navigating to the asset that you're interested in, double clicking on it and get the information you're interested in, as an example. Uh, where else do we have a question? Where's Alan? Oh, there he is. Uh, we must have a question over on the left side. <laughs> uh, any other questions? All right, going once. You know, usually at this point I threaten, I say, well, you know, it's a Q&A period. If you don't ask any questions, then I start asking questions of the audience, but I'll let that go. Uh, going once, going twice. All right, we'll close out the session now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.